uh, there are there's no numbering system so the alphabet and the numbering system is one and that's why I always uh, put the number with the glip because the uh, the glip each glip represents a certain number so in Hebrew it counts one through nine we'll get into some of that this morning and then it counts ten through ninety and then it counts a hundred through nine hundred Okay. Okay. Right. 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. Each. So the glip goes that way. 10, so they don't have 11. There's no 11 in it. You would have 10 plus 1. And so each glip, like a 10, is a yud. That's the, that's the smallest glip in the alphabet. And uh, it equals 10. So. So each glip has a number value and an alphabetic. So when I see yud, I know it's number 10. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so uh, it, and it, works, it works in gematria, which gematria, uh, I, I'll try to explain that some as I go through because I'll use some gematria. Okay? Uh, as we go, because I, you know, I'm going to touch on some things this afternoon. That's probably very different to what everything we've ever heard and are been taught, mm-hmm. especially in Genesis chapter three, because I'll touch a little bit of things in there. Which, I mean, all I do is I hope that I just stir your mind to think and maybe uh, do some research and look for yourself about different things, because there's not any way. I mean, I can answer all the questions I possibly can, but. Uh, I'll see what I, you know, I'll work with it as I can. Do we need another chair for him? Okay, good deal. Okay, what, uh, what I'd like to do is uh, let's just go ahead and open up to Genesis 1 and just jump right in here. I want to read this. This is a little note. I, you know, I, I meditate and then I, it, I'll come up with things and write them down. And I have got volumes of things written that I need to get in, a, in book form, but... Uh, it's coming about. Okay, Genesis 1. Just look at this. Um, I used to say I could probably spend the rest of my life in the first 12 chapters of the book of Genesis and never scratch the surface of what's there because there's just so much there. So to me, I say this is the foundation. So actually from Genesis 1, the introduction of what I would say is the, the blueprint or the diagram for the building structure of the temple of God, which is a human body. And then what I want to do is from there go to uh, all, from there to Genesis 12 where we get to Abraham. That's where the introduction of Abraham and Sarah at Genesis 12. And when you get to that, then you, then you begin to take the human body that God has built through the different characters in Genesis 1 through 11. That's what that is, the different characters and how they work. Uh, I mean, you know, it, there's just so much that I could share, but that I do share incrementally bits and pieces over the years about those first 12 chapters. When you get to Genesis 12, you get to the introduction of Abram and Sarah, which refers to the what I call Galgotha, the hill of the skull, or the upper brain. Because this is the this is the control center. This is the crown. This is the seat where the king sits. Like if you go to Revelations chapter uh, four, where it says sitting around the throne. This is the throne room. Sitting around the throne are the twenty four elders, and so actually coming off of what's called the twelve paired cranial nerve from the brain. You have twelve. Major nerves coming off the right hemisphere of your brain, 12 major nerves coming off the left hemisphere of your nerve to build the, the cranial nerve going down the back of your head into the whole body. That's your Abram and Sarah. So you get into Genesis 12, and then the rest of the book shows you how the whole house works and functions. So when you get into the characters, you get into Jacob. Jacob shows how the lower man, 
the physical body. That's what his name, Jacob, means surplanter, deceiver, tricker, or whatever. That's how the physical body is. It's a, it's, it's a jokester. And it is. Place jokes on us all the time. It shows you how it works and how it functions. And God says, no, so that's, that's not your real name. Your real name is Israel. Those are Egyptian words. Isis is the Egyptian female goddess. Ra is the Egyptian male term for God, the sun. And El is the Egyptian terminology for power. So Israel, all, that's all Egyptian mythology. And it's referring to, again, to the physical body. And that's, what, that's the whole story of Israel. And if you remember, Jacob, Israel has what? Twelve sons, right? That's referring to the twelve astrological signs, which shows the whole twelve points of the physical body. Starting with Aries is the head. That's what the ram represents. Aries, the head. Libra is the pelvic. It's the balance. It's, it's always, Libra is called judgment. That's a poor terminology for it. It should be balance because it's where the pelvic bone, and between the pelvic bone are the gonads, it's the creative. So everything in here in the sexual organ is in here in the head. This mirrors this. The below mirrors the above. You, you follow what I'm saying? As above, so below. You know, and that's where I tell people, go watch that little Cullen Smith. He'll just blow your brain. And, uh, he talks about as above the belt, so below the belt. And gets into graphic material, and he tells people, this is adult material. And if you can't handle it, then then just go away. <laughs> and, and I tell you, he will blow your mind. But he is very, very he's a young guy, but very, very deep and very sharp. So, so I, I use a lot of, and I'll point out the reason I'm using some of these numbers as we go through this, or at least I'll try to do that if I don't get so carried away and forget. And if I do, just bring me back and remind me or ask me a question. Genesis 1, 1. Let's just read over that again. Uh, Genesis 1, verse 1 through 3. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth, the heaven and the earth. The earth was without form and void. Darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God brooded, hovered, moved over the face of the waters. Waters, plural. And, of course, we talked about the waters uh, this morning right over here uh, we have it somewhere I thought where I wrote it up right here Sheen Mem Yod Mem now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw back on this Sheen Mem Yod Mem in a little bit because the word heaven is used throughout scripture it always refers to the two aspects of the physical body the waters above the waters below because we are a water vessel So, and the scripture is all about water it's just you know you're crossing the water uh, you're getting thrown in the water in a big fish uh, it's just water, 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 water and so the MIM 600 that's, that's uh, waters, that refers to waters above, the MIM 40 refers to waters below this is material this is spiritual Okay, and, and you'll see this uh, in different things I'll show it to you in different ways where you'll see the waters above, the spiritual aspects of them, or I, I pray that you'll be able to see that so, you know, if I spelled the Hebrew word Elohim, which I don't have it there, let me, let me go ahead and stick it up here because we talked about it this morning. Uh, let me go ahead and see if, if I can get it. Uh, let's see, how is it? Alif La Mead. I don't forgot how to spell Elohim. -H -I -M. Yeah, H. There you go. H. Thank you. H in Hebrew is the hay. And it, this has a 5 value. This has a 30 value. This has a 1 value. He Him. Yud. That's what we talked about. It has a 10 value. And then Mim. And this has a 600 value. And I don't want you to pay attention to this and notice this particular word. This is the word that we, that we use, and it is the word for God, okay? It can be God. It's, it's 
better terminology is God's. It's always translated God except in quite a number of places. Then it says God's. And the reason it says that is because that represents the 12 astrological points in the zodiac or the Maseroth. But if you'll notice right here is the same as right here. You see that? So Elohim has heaven in it. In other words, in this word, Elohim, we call it God, it has those, the last mem in, in heaven. Shin, mem, yod, mem. Shamayim. This is yim. So these are the waters above. It's the waters above that are divine, that are filled with the divine light. That's what it says right here in verse 3, Genesis. It says, uh, uh, I mean, yeah, verse 3, And God said, Let there be light, or this has the light deposited in it. These are the waters above. This is, uh, it's like the light has, every spark of the light has a building block in it that builds a physical body. So, you know, when they say you're a chip off the old block, it's the truth because you are as God is. As God is light, so are we light. We're light vessels. And when you, we, we, Genesis 2 7, when it says, And God made man, formed man of the dust, that's a poor rendering of the Hebrew word. It's the Hebrew word afar. The Hebrew word afar means particles of light. And those particles of light are so fine, they appear to be a powder of dust. And that powder of dust is constantly gleaming or coming forth into the earth through what we call spirit soul. And in that is the, I mean, if it's just a speck that you can't even see, it still is a spark off of the block of the, of the God itself, the sun. So the sun is constantly throwing out solar flares, right? Go all over there, constantly going out. Well, what is it doing? It's constantly spewing out the light. And that light is intelligence. The light is intelligent. I mean, a lot of these things that I say you can get just by spending some time in, sun, in the sunlight, especially in the early morning. Especially in the early morning. You know, from, say, from sunrise is around 7-ish, from 7 to... 10 or so in that period of time you can get the, because that's that's intelligence coming out and you say well I didn't get nothing but a suntan or sunburned or whatever well you will if you'll take time it'll impart itself and it'll begin to cultivate you and develop you and grow you and all of these other wonderful marvelous things that it that it does so these last two glyphs in heaven the word heaven which is Yod Mim, are the same as the last two glyphs in the name for God, Elohim. It's not just a similarity, but when you add all this together, 610, 40, 5, 46, right? Right. 646. And so when you add that up, 6 and 4 is 10. Huh? And 6 is how much? 16 and 6 and 1 is what? 7. Now you have to pay attention to that word heaven. 7, heaven, 7, 7. And so here we go. This is the key to everything. And, and this, all this does, it just simply represents the physical body. It just, uh, it just is a representation of the physical body. This is a representation of you. So every time that you see this number seven or any time you have a word that through gematria is reducing a word to its lowest common denominator numerically in gematria. So when you do that, then that word that you're looking at has much to do with whatever the number seven represents. So when you take the word Elohim, God, it has to do with the man. You can't separate God and man. You can't separate man and God. Man is a reflection of God, and God is a reflection of man. They're one and the same. They, they, they reflect each other. They have to do with each other. And so uh, the mem, this is pregnant with the light. This, this last mem right here, this is pregnant with the light. And in that, in that pregnancy, that light has uh, encoded it with intelligence with knowledge. 
And that knowledge is what we are looking for. That knowledge builds the physical body. It builds the container, the house, the temple in which we are. And the, when we uh, look at this numbering system in, in Hebrew, and you have, we'll do this, we, you have one through nine, and then you change and you go from ten through ninety, and then you change and you go from a hundred through nine hundred. And the, the beauty of this is, and I want you to show you, this, anytime that you see these single numbers, they deal with the design. So when I reduce this name Elohim down to its lowest common denominator, it comes up to this number, seven. So the in seven is a design. And seven and Sabbath aren't the same. They're not even the same word in Hebrew. The seventh number is peace and freedom. So when you see that, everything that comes out of that is peace and freedom. Now we're not told that. Nobody see that that's the core of who you are. That's that's the that's what your heart longs for more than anything is peace and freedom. It doesn't any time that you take the physical body and you put all these restraints and different things on it and and you imprison it. See in Greek the word for body is soma. In Greek, the word for, for slave is sema. It's exactly the same word. You just change the vowels on it. It's the same word. So in reality, when Scripture talks about the slave, it's really referring to the physical body because the physical body is built as a container to serve, as a slave, God. That's the whole purpose of it. The, the whole design of it. So it's in that like that. And if we can understand that, we would you know, we'd get far. I want to show you something about this number. Number nine is the most mystical number of all numbers. Yeah, you can Google that and you can find this. If you uh, take Elohim, we always draw a circle. Circle being the oldest glyph that there is. What do they call this circle? What is the degrees of it? How many? 300 360 degree. That makes a perfect circle. Do Jamatra on it. Six and three is what? Nine. If we cut this circle in half, we have daylight and night. We cut it in half. We have 180 degrees in this half of the circle. We have 180 degrees in this half of the circle. What does it equal? Well, let's make it yod hey vav hey. Now this, you see me use this glyph constantly, don't you? Right? Everybody's, everybody's familiar with this glyph right here, the, the cross with the circle. This is, the, this is where we get Jehovah from. But if we single this out into the four sections it is, this is like looking at the pyramid from above. And, and the pyramid actually has this in it, in its dimensions. This is the pyramid. The Egyptian pyramid is the same thing as this. But when you look at this angle right here, what do they call that? A 45 degree angle. What does it equal? Go in, you just go infinitum with it. It's amazing what you can do. And you just keep doing it. Now these, all of these numbers and dimensions, are just, and you can just keep dividing this circle up. And every time you divide it, you're still going to come up with nine. So nine is simply being that mystical number. Seven simply being the number of of the temple or the house that God built. Scripture's in more about this than anything. And it's just constantly woven in and out of it, through in and throughout. So now then, if I, let me read my notes, this the little thing I wrote, and we'll just jump from here and see how far we can get. In Egyptian aeroglyphs, we have the word atum, A-T-U-M, which refers to the atom, which we talked about this morning. We don't want to get off on that and the sidetrack. That, that's all about this over here, the atom, the atom, which is Adam. And Dawn asked me a question. She was a little bit confused. And, I, and she asked this question. Most people are confused when I try to tell them that this is Adam or Adam. It don't matter if it's male or female. And everybody says, well, how, how, where did where'd the woman come from if this was just a man? And I said, well, this was androgynous. So it has to do with the male, the brain being male and female. 
your upper brain, that looks like you got a mask on, so I'll just de him for a moment. <laughs> so, so there's your upper brain. Uh, this is Adam and Eve. And I told you the first 40 to 50 days in the gestation period, there is no sex, period. It's neither. It's being built. And then all of a sudden, somewhere between the 40th and 50 days, and my research shows me that on the 50th day, almost exact, it chooses a sex. So this is, you know, this is male, and this is female, and then on the 50th day, this up here begins to manifest this down here, whether this be a male or a female. But yet in the head... And here you can watch Colin Smith. This is, this is a little, I, I don't mean this to be vulgar, but this is, the body is built by perfect design. The mouth represents the womb. The tongue represents the penis. And so up here you have both male and female attributes to your physical body. I don't care who you are. So you're both male and female. And these work together, both the penis and the womb, they work together. Well, down here you materially manifest it as either or. That happens on the 50th day. So then you become a man or you become a woman. And so out of that is where they have the ideology of Adam and Eve, which doesn't appear until the end of the third chapter of Genesis. And we'll look at that some and... Uh, and see what we can extract from that. So, so this is Adam, both male and female, or Atom, or Atom, A T O M. Got it? Is that? Did I get confusion on it or no? No, no. I was just thinking. You know, you, you, you brought out that that the top is the the bottom becomes like the top, and you know, male or female, but. The testicles of a man reflects the same thing. It's the ovaries. Ovaries of the woman, yeah. Not any difference. Yeah. Uh, a penis is a a penis is a womb yeah. exverted. Okay. A womb is a penis inverted. They're the same thing. Yeah. Testicles are ovaries. There's no difference, you see. See, that seems that's so technical, but it ain't no it ain't that technical. It it's all in a design that's perfect and beautiful. And if we would start to look, I say that's exactly why you wear this this shirt and what does it say? Stick man what? Theology on the very back. That's what stick man theology is about. You gotta think out of the religious box that we've been so brainwashed in. It's not a true box. It never ever has served us. It don't serve us now. What really serves us is the truth. The truth will set you free and it will serve you for... We have all kinds of wonderful, beautiful, marvelous people teaching all kinds of garbage on, on, the, yeah. on YouTube and on the internet that they've gotten from a literal interpretation of this beautiful book because they don't understand these things I'm sharing with you. Things that aren't complicated. They come up with all kinds of weird... Weird, weird, weird. Blah, 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 blah. People that I enjoy, people that I uh, get, I extract some stuff from. But <laughs> all right, I'm not throwing no stones at anybody that you like. I I don't mean to anyway. So this this word man, this word man in Sanskrit, this the word man, which is referring to mankind. You have to understand what I'm talking about. I, I don't even like to say human because I have some people say, well, you know human comes from hewn down. Man's been cut down. Okay. You know, I, I, you know, I can get into dialogue with that. Nah, da, 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 da. Or I could just put a kind on the end of it. Well, does mankind mean women kind too? Yes, the word is intended to be Male and female. It's intended to be androgynous. You see, I have a, we have a gross error in the New Testament in two places where they take the word monogenesis. Simple Greek word, monogenesis. Actually, it simply means to come from an androgynous source only. And you know how they translated that? One son only. It don't mean that. It means that everybody comes from 
the one source. That's androgynous. That's the source of God. So, so there is no only begotten Son of God. That is such a gross error in the King James Bible. There is no such thing as an only begotten Son. Oh, Brother Lynn, what does that do with Jesus? Not a thing. I ain't taking away from you. If you want God to hover over him and make love to Mary and produce a baby, I'm not upset with that. It ain't true. It just ain't true. The only way a woman can produce a child is to have a seed from a man go in her womb. Yeah. Don't happen any other way. Oh, but Brother Lynn, don't you realize God can do that? Uh, well, God can do anything. Uh, you hear all these fools. God doesn't break His own laws. If God sets something up on a principle, then God Himself stays by that principle. You know, you'd think if God says do not kill, then He ain't going to go around and kill everything, every Hittite, Jubasite, and Yananite, and Nedadite, and their dogs and their kids and everything else. Yeah. It's foolish to think that. But yet we think somehow or another God gives rules and regulations, but God's not liable to them. It's like my daddy said, Don't you smoke. <laughs> daddy! Uh, you're going to do it. I'm going to do it. Hello? And, you know, and, and so we have this confusion. And I'm sorry to say that most of the confusion is not really from the beauty of this marvelous book. It's from the translations of this marvelous book. The additions or the deletions. But I don't have to get mad at those priests or whoever messed it up. I can go into it and I can do this exactly like Proverbs said. If you want to find the gold, the treasure that's in it, you're going to have to dig. You can do like I've done years and years, days and nights of study and research. Oh God, I found the jewel. And when you do, it'll change your life. It'll set you free. And you, you don't have to go argue. I don't have to argue with the preacher down the road that this is right or wrong. I say, hey, you, I can show you what I see. If you don't want to see it, that's okay. You're, you, you're good. It's no problem. You're good. Uh, so, uh, man. I love you anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. I love you anyway. The word man in Sanskrit means to think. So what did God create man for? God created man for its thinking apparatus. So how does God think? Through man. Not just female, but through mankind. Through us, through you and me. This, this is how God thinks. God emanates His thoughts. Well, guess what? Where do you think that stream of life is? It says in Ezekiel, it says, There are all manners of fish in the river. Which is referring in, in that's, that's symbolic language or typological language to just simply say there are all manner of thoughts in the stream. You can think all kinds of stuff. Somebody says, well, it wasn't God. It may have been. It may have been that you just didn't interpret it right. Maybe you didn't hear it right. Maybe you didn't see it right. But God thinks through you. So the stream of thought comes through you. Now what do you do with it? How do you interpolate it? Wow, that can be very different. <laughs> we can interpolate a lot. You know, it's like I was cutting up with Annie and I heard this years ago when uh, T.L. Osborne, T.L. and Daisy Osborne, I don't know if you guys have heard of them or you remember T.L. and Daisy Osborne. T.L. said when he was a young guy, 14 or 15 plowing, he said he saw in the sky. He said all of a sudden it was in the sky. He said he just saw a GP. He thought, wow, God wants me to go preach. <laughs> and he went down a road and he plowed. He went, got in ministry and went uh, to Africa or somewhere. He'd been in ministry for 10 or 15. And a guy said to him, you know, that may have meant go plow. Hey, <laughs> 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 you hello? God thinking. God's thinking, what do you do with it? And we do a lot of different strange things with it, don't we? And that, listen, that's not right or wrong. That's one of the worst things they ever sold us. Well, that's right or that's wrong. According to who? Yeah. According to the Baptist tradition? According to the, some other tradition, a Church of God tradition? And that generally, that's, that's right. If you, I remember when I was studying uh, seminary work, studying to become a preacher, because I thought I had to do that. I didn't know any difference. I, well, I just thought, how am I going to be a preacher? I don't know what to do. So I began studying my research in that direction. So I got involved with Dake and uh, 
his school for my ordination. And then th- at the time of that, I was also going to a church of God. I'd never s- seen such phenomenal things. Fanatical things. <laughs> If you ain't been to one, you ought to go. Especially those up in the country, in the mountains, back in the woods, they they can be rather funny. I they were so they were so radical. I would go to most of them because I never seen this stuff. I would literally be standing up in a chair, and Connie's there with my arm jerking. Lynn, get down, get down. I said, can you see what they're doing down there? <laughs> I wanted to see. I never seen stuff like that. Dear Lord, I, we was in this big church, Church of God, and it was one of those running and screaming and hollering, shanging, shanging from the flandeliers. <laughs> I'll tell you, this one guy, he was uh, burning it up. And I mean, he was going down there. Oh, Lord, he come around the corner. And boom, there was a pole right in the middle of the aisle. And it, it knocked him out cold. I mean, he was dead. Oh, they just left him laying there. I thought, God, they ought to call an ambulance. He could have a concussion. I mean, he hit that pole hard. <laughs> I've seen a lot of stuff like that. You know, and a lot of it was extremely funny. You know, and but it was their way of expressing. I'm not trying to put it down. It was just their way of expression. You know, go, you can go to the Presbyterian church and bless God, they just sit there and they don't do nothing. It's hard to get an amen. <laughs> That's the way they have been taught. That's their expression. So this stream, this river flows with all manner of thoughts. You know, the same way you can think bad and low on yourself, you can think good and high about yourself. That's, you know, which, which fish do you want to pull out of the river? You know, when you pull one out and the thing has got a bunch of stinking fat bats, throw it back. <laughs> Think on these things. Pure, just, lovely, good report, virtue, praise, thanksgiving. Think like that. It's there in the river. That's what you're designed for. God designed you to think. Now, you ever had them thoughts going on and you, dear God, you can't sleep because them things. I have. Me too. Mm-mm-mm. You know? So man in Sanskrit actually means to think. This creation from the realm of spirit slash ether called in Hebrew, ayin, A-Y-N, which actually means no slash thingness. And the reason it's called that, ayin, is because they can't name it any one thing because if they name it one thing, then it's not the other thing. Can you follow that? So the only way to describe it, because there is no way to describe it. How are you going to describe God? There is no way you can describe God. He's indescribable, unnameable. How are you going to describe him? Just exactly like they did. In. <laughs> A-Y-N. A-Y-N. That's how it is. What it is. It's nothing. No thing. Oh, but a no thing is everything. So that you don't get caught up and say, well, God is this. No, God is this. Well, Paul said God is all. Yeah. That's, right. That's the A-Y-N. That's everything. That's all in all. So it's it's the ayin, which is no thingness. By the direction of intelligence, that's what it is. This ayin is intelligence. And it's looking for personification, and its personification is in you and me. That's the house. That's That's where it seeks. It seeks you and me out for expression. And the way it does that, it does it by building us. So this uh, is, fill, is, uh, is filled with intelligence and it begins the process. This is what God does. God begins a process of stepping, <laughs> of stepping. Now, I'm going to mention a couple of words here. A stepping, we can call it descending. I'll give you another word. Falling. Those are expressions. What are we trying to express? How did God get in you? God didn't get in you because you prayed a prayer and asked Him. Just like I tried to show you in Romans 10, the Romans road. That's such a gross error that we have all learned from that. God didn't come in you because you asked Him to. 
God came in you because God built you to be His house. God came in you before you had any idea you were you. God stepped into you right here on the very, on the very moment that the seed penetrated the egg of your mama. That's when God stepped or descended or fell into humanity. At that moment, at that very moment, but he didn't fall there ignorantly, fell there with the intelligence that God is to build something. And you happen to be that thing that God stepped in to build. He descended or we use this term fell. You ain't going to find that in Genesis 2 or 3. Yeah, brother Lynn, I know that he fell. Where'd they fall? Well, the, God said, don't do this, and they did that. I said, that's exactly what the translation says that is in error. Yep. And if you do a little research, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. Well, and I used yeah. to say this. I said, let me tell you something. If there's not a mistake in Genesis 2 and 3, and I can prove to you that there's not a mistake, then why do you need a Redeemer? Yeah. Why do you need a Savior if there's not anything wrong? When you realize there's not anything wrong with the house that God created, He created it perfect, He created it fine. Yeah, but Brother Lynn, what about sin? I said, what in the world? Sin it comes from two Hebrew words, chata and chataoth. One of them is an archery term, which is actually just used costly in archery, which means you miss the target. What happens when you miss the target? Nothing. <laughs> you miss the target. Do you know what most people do? Exactly. What do you do? You do it until you can hit the target. Not right, not wrong. No, none of those things. It's something that, it's like my daddy. He always said, boy, you are hard-headed. This thing, do it again. I said, okay. <laughs> well, he wanted me to do it until I got it right. I mean, that's good. That's not wrong. That's the Hebrew word chata. The other Hebrew word is chataath, which is where we get this right here. Or does that shoot again? No, yeah, that's chata. This is the word chataath, which is this. This is called a S I N E. It's a sine wave. You know what it represents? Guess what? The timeless one did. The timeless one stepped or fell or descended into time. Now you have God, that's the sine wave. What's the sine wave? The sine wave is what gives you spring, summer, fall, and winter. The, this is what gives you the illusion of time. So God stepped out of timelessness into the illusion of time. Why? So that God can experience you and me. And you know what they call that? They vocalized it and they said, oh, now then you're in time. Well, in time... When you're in this dimension, now you're in what they call a three dimension. You're now in a three dimensional world. Well, God is beyond three dimensions. God is in a 12 dimensional reality. But now God's moved into a three dimensional reality. Is God limited to the three dimensional? No. Absolutely not. You see, that's where we limit ourselves in this three-dimensional reality. This is a three-dimensional reality, folks, whether you like it. This is a dimension of hot and cold. And out of hot and cold, it creates elementals. And as it creates elementals, that's where you get ill or evil or any of those things like that. It's where you get sickness and disease, all of the other seemingly contrary or satanic the Hebrew word sotan, the Hebrew word satan actually means adversary or that that seems to come against you. If you have an infection in your body, I will guarantee you that infection in your body will ignite something in your body called a satan. A satan is an immune system and your immune system will immediately go to attack that it's in your body that's not right. Just does that. Does it of itself because it's designed, it's created that way. That's how Satan is even used in Scripture. Hmm. <laughs> wow, where'd you get that at, Brother Lamb? I just dug it out of here in these nuggets right here. So, this stepping is the thing that Elohim is doing. He's stepping, he's falling, he's descending into his container. 
which is the physical body. Stepping or descending or fell from ether or energy or power into a dimensional manifestation. Now, I, I created that word, those two words, dimensional manifestation. And you hear God is non-dimensional. You hear that? There are no dimensions that are contrary to God, but God moves into a dimensional manifestation, which is you and me that are in a dimension. We are in a three-dimensional world. And so I, I wanted to go here off this. I made some notes. I write in my books. and If you ever get my books or you borrow them, I, I write all in my books and on the pages. I, there's, I write as much as they write in the book. <laughs> because if I'm reading stuff, good material, it's it's promotes me to think <laughs> so here was something that I thought this was something that, that uh, this author said, it says he descended or he fell by stages to earth and each step he took on a greater engrossment or materialization of his tenuous nature and correspondingly lost in spiritual char- character now that spawned a thought inside me Whoa, okay. So the deeper God steps into the material denseness of it, God begins to, or spirit, or if you remember I put up spirit slash soul. Spirit don't go without soul. Spirit, they're not the same thing, but so, spirit steps on down in here and it begins to get thicker and denser. And God steps deeper into it until he comes to this point. I call this a nadir point. He doesn't need to go any, anywhere below that. And then the soul begins to fill the entire house. The whole thing. So that everything in the house is the soul. Now then God has connection to the whole thing so God can experience it. It's God's intention the whole time. So here's some things that I wrote. He stepped. In other words, as a baby learns to take each step. And isn't that a beautiful sight? Have you not enjoyed your grandson? Sally, learning to watch him, it's just wonderful. Do they fall? Yeah. Constantly. What do you do? You spank them, bless God, you ain't never going to walk. <laughs> <laughs> Don't even get up and try again. No, no, it's beautiful to watch. You think God gets upset because when you fall <laughs> or make a mistake or do something wrong? No. no, he doesn't. He don't beat you up. He doesn't give you a spanking. A baby learns to take a step, and so mankind learns to step deeper into his or her material manifestation. So mankind stepped from its seventh dimensional reality up here. If you always think from your crown, your throne, if you always go back up here and think from here, guess what you're thinking from? The spirit. But if you always think down here and you're lower in the human, in the density of it, guess what you'll always think? From your lower nature. Okay? So mankind stepped from its seventh dimensional, in other words, ether or ethereal or spirit or light, celestial, into, stepped into, and then I put a parenthesis, not a fall or down, but stepped into his fourth dimensional reality. Step from here, one step, second step, third step, fourth step. So he stepped into his fourth dimensional reality, which is the heart. Which if you remember this morning, that's exactly all we talked about was the heart, the leb. Because it's the heart that's the key to everything. It's from the heart you learn to step back up into your higher dimension or from the heart you fall into the lower dimension. And you can get stuck down here. People get stuck down here lifetime after lifetime after lifetime. It's not necessary, but they do. We do. We get stuck in that lower dimensional reality. Stepped into his fourth dimension, into the heart which is the nadir point where the divine becomes the human to the level of physical body and its three-dimensional world, the world of contrast. Or you can call it as Paul, and Paul begins to quote some things and uh, I had some notes I wanted to read about that to the world of contrast. Let's see, this is the notes of that. Da, 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 da. 
So man, man ste- actually man steps into his humanity or his, uh, yeah, well, his humanity. His physicalness. And I think that we all we wind up doing that. All of us wind up getting into that place and that plane. So in doing this, man steps from his or her upper plane to his lower mid-plane into his fourth dimensional reality. And his fourth dimension is his Jehovah or yod yod heh vov heh. That's what Jehovah is, yod heh, or it's called the Lord. It's the same word. It's, it's all saying the same thing. In other words, it's physical manifestation manifestation. In this plane man manifests in the, the three in the three dimensional world. So now he's in this three dimensional world of time. He manifests in this three dimensional world. Thus man come under the law of the three dimensional world. And we are. It's just like the law of lift. The law of lift is bound by the law of gravity if you never seek something to rise above it. And if you seek something to rise above it, you can find the law of lift. How does an airplane fly? It operates on the law of lift. If you come down into your fourth dimensional reality and you get stuck down here in this lower third dimension earth realm, which we are. If we get stuck in this earth realm, we'll get stuck in this dimensional reality, then there we are. But you don't have to we don't have to be stuck there. And what we're learning to do is we're learning to get back out of it. I I believe I can fly. I believe I can touch the sky. <laughs> uh, just like that, all right. So thus man comes under this law and the law of the three-dimensional world of physics, chemistry, temperature, pain. Hello? Pain's not up here in the seventh-dimensional world. It's not there. How many of you got pain? Everybody sitting here got pain. Do you have to be under the pain or can be over the pain? Well... I have a gut feeling that we can be over it. I'm not saying that I'm going to make the pain go away or the pain, I'm going to say I can, I can walk in a higher plane above it. And I think we see that, I think we see it actually exemplified in, especially in athletes where men and women push beyond their pain and that's where they begin to break sound barriers or they break limits and they break records and they do all of these things. Is it without pain? Nope. I'm not made to handle it. <laughs> well, pain is a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, I'm just telling you, these are laws in a three-dimensional world. Whether, whether pain has over, overwhelmed you or overtaken you, it's a part of the three-dimensional world. It's not a part of the seven-dimensional world. I'm saying, I'm saying that we can rise above it. We can rise to a place. The three-dimensional world is filled with <coughs> temperature. You can't change the temperature. It's hot or cold. And go out there and say, be still, uh, hot heat, and come back cold. Well, then you need to move up to the North Pole. Because <laughs> you live down here, it's going to be hot. It's under physics. And I'm just listing some things that are laws. And guess what? God designed this dimensional world with these laws. They're not right or wrong. They're just simple laws. Right. Are there laws higher than that? Yes. <coughs> a law is a law wherever it's at. Doesn't mean that there's not a higher law above it. There's a higher law called air conditioning. <coughs> yeah, that's a good one right there, Phil. <coughs> they said steel couldn't float 400 years ago. And now if you go out here and you look at this massive boat that hauls five or 6,000 cars in here, there's not any telling how many tons of steel that sucker right. weighs, but yet it floats. Not only does it with float... With all the steel them cars on it. With all, exactly, that's what I was fixing to say, with the weight of five or 6,000 cars. That's the most massive boat I've ever seen in my life. It floats. What does it do? It's operating on a higher law. That, but that doesn't do away with the law. It's still there. It's just a higher law. I'm not saying that there's not a... I'm saying that there is a way that I can rise above pain. Yeah. 
or sickness or disease. I'm not saying that there's not disease. It's a part of this three-dimensional world. That's, what, that's a part of the laws of this dimensional reality. That's a part of the elements. Hot and cold is a part of the elements. And through his or her body is attached to and subjected to the influences. Every one of us are subjected to these influences, but we don't have to stay under these influences. We have been built by a marvelous design, and that marvelous design has empowered us and given us an ability to rise above this three-dimensional world, this three-dimensional reality. God's son figured that out about that boat. <clears throat> How to make it float. Yeah, how to, be, how to make it be still and still float. That's right. There you go. So this container right here is the temple. It's the house of God. This is you. This is, this is your reality. This is the seven days of he, in Hebrew, the seven yoms, facets of life. That's what the word yom means, facets of life. It's translated for the word day. So Genesis 1.1 1, 1, through Genesis 2.4 are about the seven yoms. That's the blueprint that God used to build the physical body. And it just repeats it over and over and over. And that's exactly who you and I are. So go with me real quickly now to Genesis 30. And I'm going to try to uh, wind down here or find a place to disconnect. And if we have a chance, we can get into some dialogue or uh, questions and see if we can find answers or... Or maybe we can't. Genesis chapter 30, if you would. Just, I want you to see these passages of Scripture in your own Bible. And I want you to follow me with some things here. Genesis chapter 30. And look at verse 27. Everybody, everybody there? I'm reading from the King James. So if you have a different translation, if you're in the Amplified, I, I, I don't mind hearing. I'd like to hear what the Amplified says on this verse. In verse 27... It says, And Laban said unto him, I pray thee, if I have found favor in your eyes, tarry. For I have learned by experience. Everybody say, learned Learned. by experience. experience. Learned by experience. Okay? Learned by experience. Let me see where I can. It's the non... That's the word, learn by experience. That's a little, three three glimpses. Learned by experience. Now, how many of you have ever learned something by experience? I give an illustration. When I was a little boy, three or four year old, my mama had bobby pins, and I picked one of them off the floor and straightened it out, and I was just always a curious little fella anyway. And I was curious about them plugs in the wall, and I stuck that in that plug in in the wall. And you know what it did to me? It lit them little fingers up. It did. It did burnt them really good. You know what I did ever since then? I do not stick anything in there that don't belong. <laughs> you know what I did? I learned by, by that experience. And you know what that's called? Nafesh. non sheen. That's the Hebrew glyphs. Nafesh. non sheen. And look at this word. I want you to see this word. 308 equals what? 358, right? Which equals what? 3 and 5 is 8, and 8 is what? 16. And 16 equals what? 17. Would this number have anything to do with this number? It's the same thing. Do them two numbers have anything to do with this number? It's the same thing. So here's how you begin to learn Jamatra and follow the Hebrew when you begin to see a word like this. So this word, nafesh, which has a, has a uh, geometric value, a numeric value of seven. The same as Elohim has a numeric value of seven. So really in Hebrew, anytime you see these words, you can realize these words have similarities and refer to similar things, if not the same thing. So then Elohim, Elohim, which has a numeric value of 7, and Nafesh, which learns something by experience, has a new... So guess what? God come to experience His dimension. And does you think that through you, God's learning His own dimensional reality? 
That's exactly right. Now, go with me to another passage of Scripture. 1 Kings chapter 20. A little further over in your Bible. 1 Kings chapter 20. <clears throat> and... Uh, Hmm? I'm still at my order. I'm trying to find it. Uh, First Kings, let's see it right here. Uh, Samuel. First Kings, chapter twenty. I meant to ask you what that other one said in the Amplified. Did it say the same thing? Learned by experience? Yeah, but it was a little bit longer. It went in a little more depth. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's ampl- it amplifies on it. So, now let's see what this one says. Let's see what the Amplified says by this. First uh, Kings chapter twenty and verse thirty-three. Is everybody there? It says, "Now the man did diligently observe. Diligently observe is this word right here, nafesh." Now, I don't know why they didn't put learn by experience right there because it's the same Hebrew word. Y'all still looking? Did y'all find that? Mm -hmm. Is that what it says? What does that mean to diligently observe something? Now, think about to diligently observe it. That means to look at it intently. Why? Because I'm analyzing it. I'm paying attention to it. I'm fixed on it. I'm observing this thing. I'm looking at it. That's this word right here, nafesh. Diligently observe. Are those good things? Yeah. Learn by experience. Is that a good thing? Yes, everybody, yeah. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. Did you want what this says? Yeah, tell me what that says. Yeah, because it's completely different. I'm sitting here trying to figure it out. Um, It said, now... The men took it as an omen and they hastily took it up and said... Hastily took it up. That's where they diligently observed it in the Amplified. Yeah. Yes, your brother Ben-Hadad. Then the king said, go bring him. Then Ben-Hadad came forth to him and the victorious king caused him to come up into the chariot. Yeah. 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 So the Amplified changed that a little bit. But if you... you, other, Other translations pretty much say the same thing. So... He hastily took it. Diligently observed it. Learned by experience. Now go to Genesis chapter 3. And I'm working on this word right here that has a numeric value of 7, which is nafesh. Non fe sheen. Everybody find that? I'm looking in the back of the Bible. (laughs) Genesis chapter 1. That's. In the front. (laughs) Genesis uh, chapter 3. And what I want to do, I I want to read, I want to start reading here in English and then I want to read the Hebrew word. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. It says, Now the nafesh. Now, what was nafesh, remember? What was nafesh? It meant to diligently observe, it meant to learn by experience. Now what is it? This one says serpent. Wow, now it's a snake. Mm-hmm. That's what Whoa. Now the serpent. Whoa, that's exactly the same Hebrew word. All three places, every place I just showed you is the same identical Hebrew word, the Hebrew word nafesh. Now then, is the nafesh possibly the, the psychological, physical energy, neurological energy that's in your physical body that helps you to learn by the experience of something, helps you to diligently observe a thing, or helps you to, to begin to see it in a different light? Yes. Is that a necessary thing in the physical body? Yes. You see, this is not a mistake that the serpent began to introduce itself to the man and the woman. This is a necessary thing. And I want to close with this one passage of Scripture because I don't want to get into teaching on the serpent and on Satan, on the devil, and on the snake. By the way, the Hebrew word for snake is sa'ir. It's not nachesh. It's sa'ir. So when Moses encountered the serpent in the wilderness, he encountered two aspects of the serpent in the wilderness. And one of them, or not one Moses, it was... uh, 
<coughs> was it Jacob that encountered which one which one was it that encountered the serpent? I was thinking it was a Jacob. Oh well, let me that's a whole other thing. We won't get into that. I want to close with this passage right here in Genesis chapter three and I want to read it to you. I want to read it to you right here in Genesis three and verse thirteen. There's so much that we could stop and extract from the book of Genesis uh, chapter 3. Uh, there's just so much here. Like for the first time that you see the word curse is in Genesis chapter 14. And the word for light. <coughs> Did I put the word for light anywhere on here some, somewhere? <coughs> the word for light is order. The word for curse is order, order. It's light spelt twice. Do you know what it means? It means the light from without is having tension against the light within. And they call that a curse. It's not a curse. That's how life is performed. It's the light from without pulling on the light from within. That's the constant. We call it, it's not a struggle. And so they translate it for the word curse. So it's just like when she did this and it says, and God cursed the ground and cursed everything. Well, what it says in the Hebrew, it says, and God put this light tension. And in this light tension, the light from above was pulling on the light that's in the darkness. How do you think a plant comes up out of the ground? It's the sun. It's the light from up there pulling on the light that's in that seed. And it's got that tension. And bless God, he said, I'm pulling it up out of the ground. That's what a curse is. It's the light of God that's on the outside of you pulling against the light of God. He deposited inside you to raise you up above this point right here. To get you back up into your higher dimension so you can learn to think from your seventh dimensional reality instead of staying in your lower three dimensional reality. He says, I'm calling you boy. That's exactly what he's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you'd have to, you'd have to meet my older brother. Uh, my older brother, he's a big guy. He's six foot five, and he was a GBI narcotics agent. And yeah, I mean, he was the epitome of mean. Me and him grew up fighting all the time. And uh, he was a GBI, and he used to before he would stop people on the highway and do things. And he said, "Bless God, you don't call me boy. I'm a man." <laughs> <laughs> He would throw you through the wall if you called him a boy. <clears throat> but anyway, I agree with you, Phil. <laughs> I agree with you, Phil. That's why me and him fought all the time. Huh? Oh, my. hallelujah. Mm, gosh, I hope you're getting this. And I could, just speak, I could say in speech a whole plethora of stuff, especially on when you get to this word light, or light is light. You see, the same identical word for curse is the same identical word for Ararat. Have you ever heard of that word? Yeah. Is that where the boat landed? Yeah. Well, the only difference is when they spelt the word Ararat, it's the same as the word curse. It's R or Tov. And so what, it, what they did is they added a dimension to it when they got it to Ararat over there in Genesis chapter 7, chapter 8. When they got it to Genesis chapter 8, God's showing, okay, we're in this water struggle. Is that not what the boat was all about? We're in this water struggle. What is the water struggle? It's the waters above calling to the waters below and there is that tension that's in there. The lights is deposited in and the lights that's on the outside pulling against each other and they have kind of a struggle. They call that curse. Or they call it air uh, tov. They put the tov, which is the is the uh, the twenty second glyph in the Hebrew alphabet, it has a number value of forty. And actually because it has the four into one, two, three, four dimensional reality, it actually throws the divine, which is three. It's got three. You remember over here, we got the three. This is always divine. Always at the bottom. Spirit, soul, body. However how you want to look at it. Any way you want to look at it. It always refers to God. It's because it has three characters in it. It's thrown itself into this element of dimensional reality. In other words, to the yod heh vav hey, to the the spring, summer, fall, and winter it throwed itself into time. So now you have the light 
from without, struggling against the light from within, saying that I've brought you to a new time in your reality. And that's what Ararat's all about. It's about God bringing you in this boat of the physical body to a place. We're at that place right now. We are on the top of Ararat. You're at the place of a dimensional time where the light on the outside is pulling against the light on the inside of you and saying, it's time for a new reality. Amen. Yes. Yes. <clears throat> yeah, well, go back with me to Genesis 3 and I'm quitting. <laughs> on this one verse, verse 13. Gosh, it's so uh, <clears throat> it's so uh, wonderful when you... Uh, I, I tell you, sometimes when I get in my study and my research and I'm digging on this stuff and I know I'm onto something, I, I know it because I can feel it in my gut and I know God's about to unload a mother load, you know, and boy, I, whew, I get to the point, and you know, I can't even, I have to get up and walk and pace and uh, talk in tongues and because it's just so good. I'm going to read you the gross error of this translation right here, but let me read it to you out of uh, this book. It says, this, this uh, verse says right here in 13, The Lord God said unto the woman, What is this that you've done? And the woman said, The serpent beguiled me, and I did eat. That's where we first got to blame. It's somebody else's fault. It ain't mine. It's somebody else's fault. Okay, now here's what this says in Hebrew. And uh, I won't take all the time to break it down, but I will show you a few things in it because I want you to see what this is about. The serpent beguiled me. That's what she said. What the true reading gives us is far more significant. The Hebrew phrase, Hana, Hash, Hashayini. That's what the Hebrew phrase is for the serpent beguile me. That's the serpent is the ha nachash, referring to this. And then it says did beguile me. And the word beguile me is ha shayin. Where did I put it? Shayin. That's the word for heaven. This is the word for heaven. So this is what the Hebrew says. The hanash, hanahash, that's the serpent. Begal me, hash shayini, as is so often true in most beautiful passages, is impossible to translate into two or three words. In other words, that's so deep, so rich right there in words that it don't even come close to saying what it, what should be saying, what is truly meant to be said. It is. It has to do with the action of the letter sheen. That's this word right here, sheen. Sheen. What does that say? What, what does it sound like? Have you ever dropped water on the hot stove? Bake it right. Yes. Bake it right. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly what it is. Bacon frying. Hot water boiling on the stove. Shh. This is the sheen. This always, this is the this is the spirit. The number 300 always represents the spirit. See, it has the three. That's the the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Spirit, and then it's in a three-dimensional reality. So it's in the, I mean, not a three-dimensional reality. It has the three numbers of the Trinity. 300, always it represents the Spirit or it represents fire in matter. So part of the Nachesh is the fire in the material matter, physical body. And so here's what he says. He says right here, go on to... It has to do with the action of the letter Sheen, which we met with after Adam's so-called sleep. Sheen. It is, remem it, it is remembered. It stands for the cosmic breath of life. And we have seen that the true meaning is not that they were naked and not ashamed, which has nothing to do with the letter numbers of the text, but that they were left without the sheen. What does that mean? You see, when the baby is incubating in the womb of its mama, it don't have that. What is that? It don't breathe. It ain't breathing. It's not breathing the air. It's not breathing the breath of God. 
Did God build it to this? But when God pushes it out of the womb, what this passage in Genesis is talking about is talking about the finalization of the of the embryo as it grows. It's built lungs in it, but the lungs hadn't breathed. The lungs haven't expanded yet, but they're there. That's what this passage is about. And it says the serpent be gone. It had nothing to do with it. It said, I ain't been breathed yet. <sighs> I'm being prepared to be pushed out of this garden in which when I breathe, then the Spirit will engulf me and it will fill me and it will empower me. That's one of the reasons that they want you and me to learn. Like as Francis was teaching us, learning different levels of breathing, different ways of breathing, different things that we can do through our breath to give energy to our physical body. I mean, you know, it's just like if I were to stand up here and go... And I just kept doing it for about, about a minute. <laughs> what do y'all think I would do? <laughs> yeah, I would just get drunk. I'd fall, I'd fall over. Why? That's breathing. But it's not breathing right. And that's, that's what he's saying. What? Because I need to get this nachesh exercised. I need to get him working so that he can experience, I can learn by observation. I can do all of these things I've been designed to do. Without air, you don't have fire. That's right. None. Zero. So, oh, hallelujah. We will, the sheen is the fire. The sheen is the fire. It's building the breath. That's good. Glory. Okay. Let there be light. Amen. Let there be light. Yes. Let that light fill us and flood us.